Hello once again. I have something really cool to show you guys today. To steal a quote from another YouTuber, Mint in the Box. This is something I bought myself uh, on eBay for Christmas. This is an EverReady Captain portable fluorescent lantern and it was made around 1972 or 73. And indeed, this is a mint in the box item. Works perfectly, cosmetically, nearly perfect. And uh, I'm really excited to show you guys today. This was the competitor to the Burgess Safari Light, another very early fluorescent lantern that I've shown you in previous videos. Here's mine, which I converted from the uh, extinct 69 volt batteries that it used to, to a lithium ion battery pack. And the Ever 80 Captain Fluorescent was the uh, direct competitor to the Safari Light. It even used the same batteries. And I will be converting this to use a modern battery source like I did the Safari Light. I haven't done it yet, and I won't be doing that in this video. That'll be something to show in another video. But today, we're just gonna go over this thing, take a look at it, demonstrate it. So first we'll take a look at the box here. So this sold for $39.95 in the early 1970s, which is this much in today's money. Uh, so very expensive. And uh, it says EverReady Indoor Out, Outdoor Indoor Fluorescent Light. The model number is 160WB. Here's what it looks like right there. Provides indoor lighting outdoors. Safe, versatile, long-lasting. And you can see this photograph here. Um, the only thing I don't really like about this, you can see, you know, the photo's well lit and it, it kind of gives the impression that that light there is providing all this light when obviously uh, it was done with a camera flash. You can see the shadows and stuff, but that's just me being pedantic. But it's cool nonetheless. You don't see photographs and, and drawings and stuff on uh, product boxes anymore. Um, you know, a bit more work went into stuff like this to catch the consumer's eye back in the day. On the top, we have another photograph. As mobile and versatile as your mobile home, hang it, tote it, or use it as a permanent fixture. The answer to wide area illumination in campers. Go around the left side. We've got a couple more photos here. No better light for emergencies. Use in any position. An ideal standby auxiliary light. Use in those hard to illuminate out of the way places on 120 volt household current. When power failures occur, simply plug into the battery battery power pack. Four and a half feet of cord allows complete flexibility. Contains one light and two premium 69 volt batteries. I did not get a set of batteries with this. Not that it would have mattered anyway. Uh, we'll go on the right side first couple more photographs. In the yard, bright wide angle area illumination, truly indoor light, outdoors. And they've actually got two of them in this photo. And then here it says completely portable, safe and clean, no fuel to spill, all weather dependability. That's how these, the whole concept of these portable fluorescent lanterns came about was they touted them as an alternative to the fuel-based lanterns like the Coleman lanterns that you could buy at the time because those at, at that time those were the best source of portable light you could get better than any electric portable light source and that's how they came up with these you know the cool white fluorescent lamp that they included with them gave out a color of light similar to the Coleman lanterns and, you know, it, it was bright enough that it could be a genuine competitor um, to those lanterns without having to deal with fuel and, and stuff like that. So that's how the whole, that's how these things were able to materialize. Going around the back, we have instructions for it. So there you can see, that's how you load the batteries. The battery pack is detachable in this, unlike the Safari light where the battery compartment's a part of the main unit. This actually has the battery pack, the, the rear half there detaches from it. And that's how you can put your batteries in. It also shows how to remove the fluorescent lamp. 8 watt fluorescent lamp, just like the Safari light. And it gives you instructions there, how to load batteries, how to operate, to light. I'll let you pause and read that if you want. 
AC operation. If the lamp section is to be operated farther from the battery pack than the 4.5 foot cord allows, simply use standard 120 volt AC extension cord to reach desired location. So, it's, it's kind of weird, and you'll see this obviously when I take it out, but it's kind of interesting. The main unit attaches to the battery pack through a standard mains power cord. The battery pack just has an ordinary two prong outlet on it, 120 volt outlet. And uh, you just plug the unit into it, and that's how you connect to the to battery power. The the resistive ballast that's needed on battery power is actually inside the battery pack itself, not the main unit. And I'm just noticing now that's actually kind of hilarious. They actually uh, specify that you can use a normal extension cord to connect to the battery pack if you have to, if if you can't have the battery pack. Um, attached to the unit for some reason. That's that's kind of interesting. Cut out directions and save for future reference. Well, luckily the original owner didn't do that. I forget if there's anything on the bottom. Uh, oh! Right, so we have this uh, little label here. This was sold in a Montgomery Ward store. Kind of interesting. In uh, Festus, Missouri. And they actually sold it for $34.99, which is this much in today's money. They sold it March the 12th. It doesn't give a year, but I know what the year is. The year is 1973. This was sold on March 12th, 1973 at this particular Montgomery Ward store. And I'll show you how I know that when we open the box later. So let's open it up. Box is in pretty good shape considering. So we get a cardboard or a styrofoam insert. That just pulls out. And there's the unit itself, and there's where the batteries would have been. Set that back there. And there you go. So we'll set that down for for now. There you can get a look at uh, how it looks compared to the Safari Light. And here's something really special that I didn't even know was in this box at first. I didn't even know it was here until I pulled this bottom styrofoam piece out. Right there. This is the original purchase receipt that the original owner kept in the box, the original purchase receipt from Montgomery Ward. I was just so tickled. I've scanned this, I scanned this, so I have a digital copy of it now. I posted it on Twitter. Very thin paper that they used at the time, so it's gotta be gentle here. Montgomery Ward, and there's the uh, original buyer, and I checked out all this, and if the information I'm finding is correct, uh, Melvin Carpenter here, the original owner, passed away in 1999. So I'm not too worried about showing this information here because as far as I can tell, Melvin Carpenter is dead. And a completely different family live at this address now and everything. So, But yeah, you can see they stamped it there. And I, I think he ordered this. He must have ordered this over the telephone or something because it's stamped. He, he paid for it March 15th. 1973 and there you can see whoop, portable light 34.99 11 pounds 8 ounces the unit is heavy and those batteries were heavy how cool is that to have the original purchase receipt thank you for shopping wards that is just so cool and they did some back of the uh, envelope calculations here he must have ordered something else in addition to this and got a separate receipt for that. But holy moly, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. And it's just so cool. Because now we know exactly when this left the store shelf. So neat. Well, here it is. This is the EverEddy Captain Fluorescent. EverEddy sold a ton of portable lights under the Captain name. Mostly incandescent lights and searchlights and stuff like this. But they sold this one fluorescent lantern under the captain name. So, like the Safari light, there's two brightness modes, high and low. Um, but the switch design is sort of interesting. So, unlike the Safari light that had a single switch, a, a single on-off switch, 
This has the dual switch design, but unlike the usual dual switch design, where when you turn it on, pressing the off button simply temporarily disconnects it from power, um, in this switch design, the off button actually stays off. When you turn it off, it cuts off the circuitry from power. Um, so that's kind of interesting, and that's actually really good, because that's going to make my uh, modifications for this thing for a DC-DC converter. It's going to make it way easier to do, and I won't have to cosmetically modify the lantern like I did with the Safari light, putting that second power switch in there for the inverter. This thing, uh, as far as I can tell with the schematics I've drawn and stuff, I'll be able to incorporate the inverter such that the off switch cuts the inverter off from the battery power, so that's gonna be really nice. Your high power switch is also your start switch. You hold it down to start, manual preheat, let go and it starts. And you've got your low switch. I've found, interestingly, if you're running on low power and you wanna go back to high, you can't just switch back to high. Um, it actually initiates the preheating again. There's no way to get it to high mode without re uh, uh, re repeating the preheat cycle. So, there's the front of it, the lens, plastic lens. It's got sort of a foggy matte finish to it. And the fluorescent lamp that's in, that's in this, I was surprised. Let me see if I can get a focus on that. The lamp this came with, presumably the original lamp, it's a Norelco F8 T533, the same lamp that came in the Burgess Safari light. And this surprised me. I would have figured Everetti would have used a GE or Sylvania lamp, but nope, they went with the Norelco just like Burgess did made in Holland, and it's got a date code on there of 1971. So very cool, I love these lamps. The 33 color is 4300K, uh, slightly cooler than the usual cool white, which is 4100 4, or 4200K, and it's a beautiful color. It's, it's, um, it's got sort of a purplish tint to it, and I just love it. My favorite fluorescent lamp color that I've ever seen. So I've got four of these now. I've got the two Norelco branded ones, and I've got two Philips branded ones from the 19 from 1970. One of which I have in the Safari light. You can see here. So yeah, very cool. Very happy to uh, get another one of these beautiful lamps. Um, you've got a handle that can pivot. Nice metal handle. Very nice. And, uh, Here's what the unit looks like. Very boxy in shape compared to the Burgess Safari light. I'll bring the Safari light here again. And uh, you can see the difference here, especially from above. And I kind of like it. I, I kind of like the captain's boxy shape. I, I, I like, you know, nice squared off uh, things. And like the Safari light, it's got these metallic... I think these are just stickers. Maybe like a really thin sheet of of uh, aluminum or something um, that's, that has adhesive put on the back and stuck to the plastic. Um, and it's got like a little laminate over it. I'm just assuming that. It might not be metal at all, I don't know. But um, it's got the logo and stuff silk screened on there. Really nice finish and it's not wearing or anything. And same for the power switch assembly. It's got the lettering silk screened on there and everything. Very, very nice, very uh, nicely finished unit. Other than part of the handle and the labeling though, this is all plastic construction, as opposed to the Safari light that has this nice uh, metal uh, cladding on the handle and a metal battery compartment door. Uh, the spine of the unit is metal and the uh, lamp housing is metal. This thing is all plastic. Oh, except for the reflector, the white reflector behind the lamp. That is sheet metal. Let me uh, detach the battery compartment. You can see how that works. So there's this little switch on here, lock and unlock. So I slide that and the main unit, and I gotta be careful here not to drop anything. The main unit becomes de detached from the battery compartment. You should have picked a not soft surface to demonstrate this on. But here's what the unit looks like detached from the battery compartment. It loses a lot of girth. And this is how you do how you do it if you want to run it just from standard 120 volt. The power cord is hidden in a little cove right here. And this N2, I think that might be a manufacturing date code, 1972. That would make sense. 
And uh, we've got some stuff printed on here. Everetti model number 160 for use with battery pack or 120 volt AC only. And then up here it says how to replace lamp. So very nice, they print those, they mold those instructions into the plastic as well as on the box. And uh, you can see the rivets here where the magnetic ballast is installed. This does have a standard magnetic ballast. I've been inside this thing and somebody else actually posted uh, internal pictures of one of these on Lighting Gallery. It's a standard uh, magnetic choke ballast for a 6 or 8 watt fluorescent lamp. Standard off the shelf part. We'll take out our power cord here. So we get a vinyl power cord, two prong, non-polarized which I think they should have put a polarized plug on this because here's the issue. Well, well, first of all, I'll set this down. We'll bring the battery box in. So here's the battery box. So you can see the battery box has a standard two-prong outlet on it, and this outlet is polarized, but the plug isn't polarized, and I think the plug should have been polarized because here's the problem. Now the Breguet Safari light specifies a particular way to install the batteries such that when you're running on the batteries, the side of the lamp that's the cathode that sees the negative side is up here. And the reason for that is to combat mercury migration. I mentioned in the video I made uh, detailing the modifications I made to this to run on a modern battery pack. I talked about how fluorescent lamps, especially modern fluorescent lamps that don't have as much mercury in them, they can suffer from mercury migration when run on DC current, such as the case in this unit and this unit when it's running on battery power. Because when you're running on DC current, only one cathode of the fluorescent lamp is actually operating as a cathode, the other cathode's operating as an anode. And as a result of that, the mercury likes to migrate towards that cathode. And what'll happen is if, if there's not enough mercury in the lamp to offset the effect, the half of the lamp that has all the mercury will be lit up bright, while the other half will be lit up really dim and sort of pink color. And as a result, you lose half your lamp brightness, and that's not very nice at all. Well, the Breguet Safari light is designed in such a way that the upper side of the lamp here serves as the cathode so that gravity can help combat the effect of mercury migration. And it's a very smart design. But Everetti didn't do that. They didn't polarize the cord so that it could only go in one way. This is an unpolarized cord, so you could plug it in here either way. So if you plug it in one way, the upper cathode will be the cathode and that's the way you want it to be. But if you plug it in the other way, your bottom cathode's going to be the cathode, and the mercury migration is going to happen a lot more severely. So, very odd that they put a polarized plug on here, but not on here. They, they uh, should have done that. I suppose maybe they did it just for ease of use. There's no huge reason why this would have to be polarized, so they just made it easier for people to plug it in. But, yeah, to combat the effect of mercury migration, they ought to have done that. But, uh... Oh well, either way. It will be a big problem though uh, when I do eventually modify this with a DC-DC converter. That plug will have to, uh, I'll have to have markings on the outlet and on the plug so that I only plug it in one way. Because if I plug it in the other way, I'm going to have reverse polarity and blow up the DC-DC converter. So I definitely don't want that. But anyway, um, there's the whole explanation of that anyway. So we'll look at the battery box here and you can see how that lock switch works. The bottom of the lantern hooks onto this little lip here and then you slide the lock switch and it locks the top portion into place. It says, do not attach battery section while operating front half on AC current. And that's weird to me. I don't know why... Uh, why would they do why would they make it so that you couldn't attach the battery portion while you're running on AC current just to make it so you don't have to set the battery compartment somewhere separate they could have cut a notch in the plastic here to give a place for the cord to route which in fact they've done on the main unit itself they have a little notch here for the uh cord uh to route through but they didn't put a similar notch on the battery compartment so it's no good but they ought to have done that so that you can attach the battery compartment while the unit's running on mains power. Maybe they did that just for safety reasons, I don't know. 
But uh, there you go anyhow. The handle is attached to the battery compartment, which I find kind of weird. I think they should have kept it on the main unit itself, but uh, whatever. But here you can see to install batteries. And it gives the instructions there. It specifies EverReady number 646 batteries. Those are equivalent to the Burgess Z46 batteries that Burgess specified for the Safari Light. Caution, do not place fingers across battery terminals. And that's a true caution to have because 69 volt batteries, you put your uh, finger across the terminals, you could actually get a shock. You put your tongue across the terminals, you're probably going to kill yourself. So... Definitely good that they put that there and of course it says never attempt to recharge batteries I'm not sure how you'd even do that. The batteries have flat terminals on them. How would you even hook them up to anything? But to open the battery compartment you slide this metal door upwards and then the bottom part pivots out and then you pull it out and there's your battery box. And so there's wiring in inside this thing and I took a picture of the inside of this which I'll show now but you can see inside this thing there's uh, a little wire to connect the batteries in series. Actually the actually it's not a wire the resistor the resistive ballast is used uh, to connect the two batteries in series so the resistive ballast actually is placed in between the batteries which is a little bit weird but it works and uh, you can see the connections to the outlet there. The outlet is literally a standard off-the-shelf component. Um, very, very cool. So yeah, you put your batteries in. You slide your door back in. Put it push down on the bottom part and then slide there, slide down. And there's your battery compartment. And yeah, as I said before, they have to put the resistive ballast in the battery compartment itself instead of the main unit. And that's also a good thing because it means if you were to plug something else into this battery compartment while the batteries are in it, uh, the resistor will make sure that there isn't an excessive amount of current flowing through whatever you have plugged in because you're dumb. If you were to, for example, plug a electric fan into this and the resistor wasn't there, uh, the fan motor, you know, is just an inductor. An inductor is a very low resistance on DC current. You'd be shorting everything out, possibly ruin your batteries, possibly ruin the motor of the fan. But with that resistor in place, that's not going to happen. 600 ohm resistor. So yeah, that's, that's good that they put it in there, even though it was a uh, required part of the design anyway, because of how they designed the unit. But uh, there's your battery compartment. Anyhow, all right, I've got the unit plugged into the wall now. Let's turn it on. Standard manual preheat circuit. And there you go. Nice and bright. I actually haven't measured the lamp current yet. I should uh, do that. See how that ballast uh, drives an 8 watt lamp. But yeah, there you go. And I know you can't see it on the video. Not helped by the fact that the uh, 60 hertz flickering is not agreeing with my camera but uh, yeah it's an F8 T533 it's got that beautiful purplish tinted uh, cool white color and uh, it's just really nice overall very bright lantern and uh, we put on low brightness and there's low brightness and uh, yeah to switch back to high brightness there's no way to push the switch so that it goes right back into high brightness you just gotta re preheat it and uh, goes back into high brightness. I'm in the bathroom now where it's totally dark and uh, I'll start the unit up here. And there it is and there I am. And uh, yeah, this thing is really bright. Focus. It lights the room right up. Very, very bright. And of course if I uh, hold it up high like a ceiling light, it lights the whole room right up. Very bright lantern. Um, I turn it down to low brightness and now it's on low brightness, half the brightness, but still providing a very large amount of light. Very nice unit. Very bright lantern. The kilowatt meter shows 150 milliamps for lamp current, which that's pretty much perfect for an 8 watt lamp. Put it down to low brightness. It's cut by half, about 70 milliamps, so half the lamp power, about 4 watts. Uh, put it back on high here. 
Power factor is 0.58, so good. There's not too much uh, resistance in that ballast. Total power of 11.2 watts, so that's that's nice. That's a good ballast. That's a well-tuned ballast. Not too much resistance in it. Puts out a perfect amount of current. You'll see if I go down into low brightness, you'll see the power factor goes way up because there's now a resistor in the circuit. Putting it on low puts a 600 ohm resistor in series with the magnetic ballast. And uh, if we look at our power now, power is 8.4 watts, despite that the lamp's only getting 4 watts, so our efficiency has tanked because we now have a resistor in the circuit putting off waste heat. Put it back on high, and despite the, pa the lamp power doubling, the total system power only goes up by a couple of watts because now that resistor is out of circuit. So very nice, very uh, well-tuned uh, magnetic ballast. Very silent too, you can't hear it at all. So something I want to do while I'm making this video and have this thing out of its box and everything, I do want to change out the lamp. I want to put away this Norelco lamp and uh, uh, not use it because it's a very fresh lamp. There's hardly any use on it. Um, you can see if I turn it on here, actually there's virtually no use on on it. No darkening of the ends or anything. So I'm going to change it out for my other Philips TL8W33. Same lamp, same color, just uh, Philips branded. And uh, like the other one that I have in the Safari light, this one's quite worn. You can see dark at the end. So I want to put this one in and... Uh, just basically, this lamp, like the one in Safari Light, probably have quite a bit of life left in it. But I figure since they're already worn, I'll put them in and uh, just keep using them until they wear out. I have modern 8 watt lamps that would work just fine in this um, that I could use. But I don't believe in uh, uh, preserving something forever. You know, I, I like to use my vintage fluorescent lamps. And, you know, I love the color and everything. I might as well use them. So, we'll change out the lamp here. So, we squeeze the reflector, uh, being careful because it is 40 year old plastic, and uh, it comes off. Here you can see the white metal reflector, and uh, you might see some bend marks in the reflector. I have removed the reflector. You have to move the reflector to uh, get to the innards, and I've done that so I could take some pictures of what it looks like and study the circuit layout for when I do my DC-DC converter modification. And uh, I'll show you those pictures I took. So here's what the inside of the lantern looks like. You can see that uh, magnetic ballast rated for a 6 or 8 watt lamp, no brand name on it. And you can see the switch assembly and what that looks like. You can see the resistor that's used in the low power mode to reduce lamp current. And they actually put a little buffer capacitor across the starter contacts to suppress arcing when you're starting the lamp. That's good. Good design. Um, so yeah, very nice. Uh, aside from that switch assembly, it's, it's a standard simple circuit. So very nice. And uh, lots of room in there. So good for modification as well. So let me get this lamp out. Yeah, upper lamp holder is recessed in that hole, so it can be a little bit tricky to get the lamp out. Now, before I do put that Philips lamp in, while I was down in the basement digging through my fluorescent lamp box, I came across this other 8 watt lamp that has no markings on it, and I have no idea what it is. I completely forget where it came from. Um, it's just got no no markings on either end of it, so I'm going to put it in here and see what it is, see what color it is and stuff, because I have no clue. Let's see what this is. Ah, it's daylight. Oh, I know where this came from. This came out of a cheap, uh, really cheap, one of those battery-powered 8AA fluorescent closet lights. I found it at a restore, I think it was at a restore quite a while ago, brand new in the package if I remember right. And uh, yeah, I bought it just because it was there and it was cheap. And also it's one of the few of those cheap closet lights that has a little barrel plug on it. So you don't have to run on batteries. You can run on a barrel jack. But nothing special otherwise. Just a standard crappy instant start ballast. Um, and it came with this lamp, which is sort of a crappy color too. It's a overly blue 
for a daylight lamp. But uh, yeah, it's a brand new lamp, no markings on it. There's low power, it gets a lot dimmer when it's on low power. Must be the way the phosphor is. But uh, yeah, works just fine. Huh. I'm almost compelled to keep this lamp in here. It's kind of a, actually kind of novel to have a to have a cheap, crappy daylight lamp in this thing. Because um, Lord knows I'm never going to use it anywhere else. Well, I'll think about it. For now, I'll put that uh, Philips lamp in, which is this one. And there you go. Same nice color. And you can see the ends are quite worn on it. I don't know how much life this lamp will have left in it, so might as well use up the rest of it. But uh yeah, there you go, anyhow. Finally, we'll take a look at what's unfortunately the only vintage me mention of this thing that I can find online. I couldn't find any advertisements or anything. All I found was this coupon, which was in the May 1972 issue of Field and Stream magazine. Save $2 on the purchase of a new EverReady outdoor fluorescent lamp number 160WB. Indoor light outdoors. No fuel to leak or burn. Detachable battery pack lets lamp hang on tent poles. Batteries last up to 72 hours. Also works on household current. Suggested retail price $39.95 including batteries. And of course about half that cost would have been the batteries. To get your $2 refund, mail your name and address, blah 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 blah. Allow four weeks for refund. Offer expires October 31st, 1972. So there you go, $2 coupon. Unfortunately, the only advertisement for this thing, not even an advertisement really, that I could find. But there you go, anyhow. So that's about all there is to show of the EverReady Captain Portable Fluorescent Lantern from 1973. I figure I'll end here with a closer comparison between this and the Burgess Safari Light because these were direct competitors. Uh, Clash of the Titans, if you will. Similar lanterns providing a similar functionality, but uh, quite different design. I'll uh, turn them profile here so you can get a good look at the uh, at the difference, the dimensions and stuff. There's the rear end. Right side and a top view. Now if you're looking to acquire one of these early preheat 8 watt fluorescent lanterns, you may be wondering which one you should get. Well there's pros and cons to each of the EverReady Captain and the Burgess Safari Light, but I'll give you the rundown of my findings right now. Um, starting with the Burgess Safari Light, it's way easier and cheaper to acquire. Burgess made the Safari Light for 8 or 10 years, sold tons of them. They sold so many Safari Lights. And as such, you can find that you can actually find them quite cheap on eBay. You can get one for pocket change sometimes. Um, as opposed to that, the EverReady Captain, you'll only see one or two or three of them on eBay at any given time, and they command a bit higher price as a result. Whereas you can get a Safari Light for sometimes as little as ten or fifteen bucks. I paid thirty bucks for my Captain, and that seems to be about the going price for one in decent condition. The Burgess Safari Light's also available in multiple styles. The EverReady Captain, there was one model, one style, but the Safari Light came in a few different body styles. Um, early Safari lights had a lot more chrome on them. They had a chrome reflector, whereas the later Safari lights have a white reflector. So there's a bit of choice you have in what kind of Safari light you'd like to get. Thirdly, with its partially metal construction, the Burgess Safari light feels a bit more solid, a bit more robust than the EverReady Captain's almost all plastic construction. The Safari light does feel like a better built device. At the end of the day, I think 
They, they're both fine. They're both high quality devices. But if I were to place a bet on which one would be more likely to survive a fall, for example, I would put my money on the Safari Lite. Finally, the Safari Lite actually has history to it. As I explained in a video I made a couple of years ago about the Safari Lite, the Safari Lite was actually deployed in the Vietnam War. It was deployed as a test, sort of a test run to see how fit the Safari Lite was for war. And so they sent some Safari Lights to Vietnam to be used by US troops in the war, which is just super cool, super cool bit of history. And uh, that might be why the Safari Light was able to sell so many units to civilians was just because of that history that came with it being in the Vietnam War, technically. So you get a bit of history, a, a bit of a conversation piece when you get a Safari Light. The Everetti Captain didn't have that. It never saw service in the Vietnam War or any war. It was sold purely to civilians. There are a few things about the Everetti Captain that can score some points over the Burgess Safari Light though. First of all, the cuboid shape of the Captain makes it a bit more compact than the Safari Light, a bit less awkward to place on a table and um, a bit less awkward to store. It also makes it a bit sturdier because both of these lanterns are pretty tall and can be knocked over a bit easy. But the Captain is a bit sturdier and I personally like the cuboid shape a bit nicer than the Safari Light, but that's up to opinion. Second of all, with its permanently attached cord and all the controls in one place, I think the Captain's a bit easier to use than the Safari Light. The Safari Light has a detachable cord, it's got buttons on each side of the unit, and there's a separate button you have to flip when you go between battery and AC mode. So the Captain's a bit simpler to use in that respect. Third of all, because of the Captain's cuboid shape and the amount of free space that's inside it, it makes it very easy to modify and easier to service. The Regas Safari Light is sealed. The various plastic and metal panels are all sealed and sort of hooked into each other. And uh, I've never taken mine apart because I can't figure out how to take it apart and I'd, I'm scared I'd break something if I do. In comparison, the Captain, everything is screwed together with the uh, exception of the ballast, which is riveted in. But uh, there's tons of space inside. It's very easy to disassemble, and it'd be quite easy to, to repair or to modify a Captain if you ever wanted to. But fourth, and this is a negative here, the Captain's removable battery compartment seems to make it easy to lose. Most Captains that I've seen on eBay are without the battery compartment. You have just the main unit for sale, and of course sellers are too dumb to look it up and check this stuff, so they're like, oh, it can be run on batteries, because that's what it says on the back of the unit, but the battery compartment isn't included. Um, so yeah, you do see a lot of Captains with no battery compartment for sale, and that's too bad. So that's about all there is to show of the Everetti Captain Portable Fluorescent Lantern from 1973. I think this is a really cool early fluorescent lantern, a bit of a piece of history from before it was commonly known how to make electronic fluorescent ballasts and how to make them affordably, when something like this had to be designed with really the same principles as if it were running on AC power, high voltage and a preheat circuit. It's really cool. And uh, I can't wait to convert this thing so it can run on a modern battery source. Like I said, I already have it all planned out. I drew the schematic. I think I know how to hook up the DC-DC converter and the battery and everything. So that unlike the Safari light where I had to install that second power switch, this thing I should be able to make it work with the built-in power switches. And that's going to be really cool. So I'm just waiting for the DC-DC converter to come in. Once it comes, I'll set to work. And once I get it finished, hopefully when I get it finished, I'll make a video showing what I did and how it works. And it should be really cool. But there you go. Thank you so much for watching. I very much hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next video.